Boker Tov and Hag Sameach, everybody, and welcome to Taste of Torah for this week. We're going to have an exceptional uh, reading because it is the uh, seventh day this coming Shabbat of Pesach, and therefore there is a special reading. We won't be following the ordinary pattern of, uh, of Torah readings progressing through. So uh, I'll be talking to you about that in just a moment, but before I do, I, I want to relate a story. <clears throat> something that just happened to Robin and myself. Uh, it's, a, it's a Sadaka related story. And uh, I'm not gonna tell this because it rebounds to any credit to me. It really rebounds to Robin's credit. So I, I think I can tell this story without being self-promoting. And that is that uh, we went out to breakfast this morning. We uh, went to a place, uh, we got uh, a uh, basically as, as close to a Pesadic meal as we could get. We got, you know, uh, eggs and we got uh, um, hash browns and uh, that was pleasant. And the waitress was shocked, no meat, no bread, no, no. And the, but it worked out very nicely. Now. While we were sitting there, in comes a gentleman, uh, stereotypically a homeless person pushing a, uh, a um, cart with things in it um, and uh, looks like all of his possessions. He sits down, he orders breakfast, and uh, I don't give it any more thought, but Robin is paying attention. And uh, so we eat our breakfast, it's wonderful. And then uh, as we're getting up, the gentleman approaches me and he says, uh, you should check out Walmart. Walmart has uh, some fantastic lamb there. Now this is, this is classic. When I wear a kippah, which is all the time now, uh, the sight of it triggers people wanting to share Jewish related or Jewish adjacent thoughts with me. So uh, he tells me all about this and I am appreciative and I thank him. And uh, then I start to leave uh, with Robin and Robin says, well, you know, he's homeless. And I said, well, yeah, I didn't want to just walk up to him and hand him money. I thought that would be embarrassing. And she says, well, I, it really is an issue because uh, I heard the waitress say, uh, well, what can you afford today? Boom. Okay, now she's got me. Now I have to think about it. But I realize it brings me to uh, something I really like uh, to be able to do when it comes to sadaka, And that is, you can really help out the dignity of a person uh, if, they, if they are able to offer you something in exchange for your gift, all right? And that feels less like uh, just handing them money. And it feels more like, uh, they've earned it. And of course, this is the classic thing that goes on with buskers. They play music and we give them money. And so it's actually an exchange and it protects the dignity of both people. So once Robin said that to me, I understood uh, what opportunity was given. I turned around, I pulled out a $10 bill and I say, I really appreciate you telling me about that uh, lamb. That was a really great lead. And I'm going to pursue that. And I just able to hand him $10 as a reward for what he did for us. So uh, when you find yourself in a potential sadaka situation with uh, someone and uh, they offer you something, then there's uh, that's deliberately designed by them, even if they're not aware of it, to uh, to protect their dignity and you can uh, give them a donation without really having to put them on the spot. Um, and I also always remind people, uh, because we tend to do this a lot in America, and that is trying to uh, adjudicate whether the poor person before us is worthy or unworthy. All right. Do, are they really genuinely poor? Are they pulling a scam? Are they going to use their money for drugs or liquor? Are they going to waste my gift? Just remember, in the Torah, there is no distinction made uh, about the poor. There's no worthy or unworthy, deserving or undeserving poor. It's just the poor. And remember that if there's a scam, the shame rebounds to them, not to you. 
you just gave and you've earned the merit of that regardless of their intention. So just keep that in mind. All right, time for our special Torah portion. Our special Torah portion uh, this week begins in Exodus 13, 7 and goes through Exodus 15. It allows us to revisit the story of the Exodus as, uh, as told in the book of Exodus. Now, to get started, because you know I always like to bring something in that uh, is uh, a curiosity, I brought you my bones, all right? So I, I have bones I've collected over the years that I keep in my freezer. And yes, this is sounds very creepy, but uh, let me share with you. So what I've got here are shank bones. All right, uh, lamb shank bones that uh, uh, over the years, Robin hates lamb, but I, if I get and get a good piece of lamb, I will do it. And when I do, I always save the shank bone uh, in order to be able to use it on my Seder plate. Now, uh, my two special ones, this is my awesomely big shank bone. And this one, I'm not sure what the heck this is. I, it's some kind of, I think, knee bone uh, and uh, quite intriguing. But in any case, uh, bones are the topic for today. All right. So what we have is in Exodus 13, starting around verse 17 and going on into chapter 14 is the flight of the Israelites. And of course, we know the uh, theme that we speak of in the Haggadah is that uh, we matzah because we were in such a hurry to get out of, the land, out of the land of Egypt that we didn't even bother to let our dough rise. However, however, interestingly enough, there is a, a moment where we're told we didn't rush so much. And that is, we're told that Moses recovers the bones of Joseph, right? Our ancestor who first brought us to the land of Egypt. That is in fulfillment of a promise that was made by uh, the children of Israel, the brothers of Joseph, uh, at the time of his death, which was when you leave this land and you return to the land that God promised us, take my bones with you and bury them there, probably at Machpelah, where the family burial site is. So um, 400 years later, Moses remembers this promise. And even though they are in a tremendous hurry to get out of the land of Egypt, he takes the time to recover uh, Joseph's bones. Now, this is actually modeled for us earlier in the story, because uh, in the previous chapter, in chapter 12, we are right in the middle of all of the, uh, uh, the plagues. It's a crisis. Uh, the Egyptians, we don't know what they're going to do. Are they going to uh, let us go. Are they going to turn violent and massacre the Israelites? Uh, uh, the, you know, the stakes just keep going higher and higher. And then in the middle of all of that, God simply says, now I'm going to teach you a ritual that you're supposed to do to celebrate this time. And that's when God gives all the instructions for the biblical version of the Passover Seder, which is much simpler than what we do now. Uh, nevertheless, it is a weird interruption in a dramatic narrative uh, saying, wait a minute, you need to take the time uh, to remember, all right? And realize that the motif of remembering and forgetting is central to the story of the Exodus. Uh, we are reminded to rem remember this day and teach it to our children. But also, how did this all start? It all started because there arose a Pharaoh who didn't remember what Joseph had done for Egypt. So forgetting is uh, what causes uh, harm and destruction. Memory is a kind of redemptive thing that ensures the future. And so Moses understands that uh, the past is never truly the past and that he needs to honor uh, this uh, promise made to a man 400 years ago 
and take his bones. And so the bones are recovered and they travel with the Israelites throughout their time in the wilderness. And they finally are brought to the land of Israel, though we are not specifically told where they're buried. All right. So uh, this all just uh, rolls right into the, um, uh, the whole theme of Passover, which is to remember uh, what we've been through in order to appreciate where we are and hopefully envision where we're going. Now, I want to add to this uh, a wonderful little moment. Now, the story of the Exodus is exceptional, not only because it's the greatest story ever told, but because there are so many important women in it, right? We've got uh, Moses's mother, we've got Moses's sister, we've got Pharaoh's daughter, we have the, the um, midwives who uh, resist the genocide being committed against the Israelites by the Egyptians. So uh, it's unusual that there are so many women featured uh, in this particular story. In most uh, biblical stories, it's, you know, it's all man stuff. It's very anthropocentric, uh, anthropocentric. It's very focused on males. Now, interestingly enough, the rabbis have over time filled in some of the gaps about women. So for example, um, let's see, I'm, I'm, let me think of one. Oh, okay. Uh, Noah's wife is mentioned in the Bible. We don't even learn her name, but in fact, the rabbis assign her a name, Nahama, and uh, ex elaborate on her story, right? Uh, the rabbis take Sarah and make her a central figure in the Akedah, the story of how um, Abraham almost sacrifices Isaac. So the rabbis recognize that women play a critical role in uh, Jewish history. And they do, through the process of Midrash, insert or reinsert women into the story. And uh, there is a particularly striking one in this case. All right. So um, uh, there is a, a person identified in the Bible, Serach Bat Asher. All right. Now, the intriguing thing, and here you see the rabbis paying close attention to what's going on, is that her name appears in the list of Israelites who come down uh, when Joseph invites them to settle in the land of Egypt. And then her name appears again in the first census taken in the wilderness after the Israelites leave. That makes her over 400 years old. The rabbis notice this and immediately they uh, start to develop a midrash around this woman who gets exceptional long age. And uh, they start out by saying uh, it is uh, Sarah who approaches Jacob to inform him that his son Joseph is alive. The, uh, the sons are too embarrassed to explain how this happened. And so it is uh, Serach who does this for our patriarch, Jacob. And as a result, God rewards her with a long life. So she comes down into Egypt, she endures the entire 400 years of slavery, and she gets to see uh, the Exodus. And she becomes, in effect, the, uh, the living memory of the Israelites at this time. So she becomes the embodiment of everything we associate with Exodus. And in fact, she is included in the story of Joseph's bones because she's the only person who can remember where Joseph's bones reside. It's been forgotten by everybody, including Moses. So uh, Moses goes to consult with her. She is able to tell him where to find the bones. He retrieves them. There are Midrashim that uh, explore the story of the bones in many fantastic versions. But in any case, it's Sarah who makes it happen. And she continues on with the Israelites uh, it, as they wander in the desert. Now, at some point, she probably passes on, but uh, she is uh, remembered. And in fact, in, I believe it's Persia, 
in what is now Iran, there is a, um, a shrine that Persian Jews created for her that supposedly is the place where she is buried. So she was perceived by Persian Jews as a saint who needed to be honored. Somehow they managed to tell the story that she ended up in Persia. So apparently she lived long enough uh, to be participate in the, the second exile uh, with the Babylonians. So a fantastic story. And uh, I actually have a, a little poem written by one of my colleagues, which I like very much. Um, and um, here it is. This was written by, who wrote this? Uh, my colleague, uh, Hara Person, who is now a very influential mocker in the reform rabbinate. Uh, she wrote this poem, which appears in the Torah, the women's commentary. And this is a poem about uh, Serach Bat Asher. Endless life for Joseph's life. I became the family historian, the keeper of tales, the finder of bones, the weaver of loose ends. That is my gift from my grandfather to revisit the suffering and joys and wanderings and with each generation to observe the endless cycles of loss and hope and pain of births and deaths, never to rest, never to finish, only to witness. So ask yourself, who is the Jewish historian in your family? Who keeps the memory of all those essential Jewish things from the past that you want to carry with you forward in your pilgrimage through life? Everybody's Hebrew name. Do you know the Hebrew names of all your relatives? Maybe you should whip out that family Tanakh and write them in there. Uh, do you know the story of your family's migration uh, to America? And once in America, where in America did they travel? Uh, any family stories that uh, are important to retell at the Seder year after year, the way we tell so many other stories. So be the historian because that makes you a vessel of redemption. With that, I'm going to stop, and I hope you're all having a Chag Sameach. Uh, I hope you're enjoying uh, whatever, your, whatever observances you're doing for the remainder of the holiday. I am probably going to go out and find myself some lamb. Uh, Robin isn't a fan of it. She calls it the gray meat. Uh, but uh, I love lamb, and since I got a lead on it, I'm going to pursue it. So, Hak Sameach, everybody, and have a great week.